Hi, I'm Roger and this is Jacob and we're going to talk to you about uh, things that governments and corporations have done to try to censor the Tor network over the past couple of years. So we start out with sort of a very quick overview of what's going on and we're going to try to get directly to the more interesting material. So a brief background about Tor, we've got something like 500,000 or 400,000 people using Tor right now. Part of the goal is to have a diverse set of people so that we've got cancer survivors and activists and militaries and corporations and everybody in between blending together on the same network. So this is a short overview of the anonymity side of Tor. We've got Alice, she's trying to browse the web to some website or destination Bob, and the adversary could be somewhere watching Alice, watching Bob, watching the middle in between. So over the past couple of years, we've had quite a bit of growth in the number of relays, but this is actually not the right slide to look at. The right slide to look at is not the number of relays, but the amount of capacity we have. So it's gone from a little under 500 megabytes per second of capacity to almost two gigabytes per second of capacity over the past couple of years. And the load on the network is also going up pretty much to keep, to keep pace with the capacity growth, which is good news for the number of people who are being kept safe, but bad news for performance because we need even more capacity. So I, I think that it's important to, to speak to the audience here about the context of the work that we do, because depending on who we talk to, we might have to explain Tor as if it is a privacy thing, and often people, they, they don't really understand contextualized privacy. So for example, when I explain this to my grandmother or to my mother, I had to explain that I work on technology that sort of functions like curtains function in her life or the way that clothes function in her life because that's the kind of privacy she understands. But here at the CCC, I think we understand that we are driving technology some people in this room have worked on deep packet inspection machines that actually work on blocking Tor, and some people are users of Tor, and we really understand the ins and outs of this technology. And so this concept of behind enemy lines, if you want to refer to the world in a way where we have enemies and we have lines, often the deep packet inspection devices that people use to filter Tor, people using Tor are behind those lines. So our users are actually behind the enemy lines in some sense, and it is worth considering that. Maybe not the enemy part, but it's worth considering they're behind the devices, these security devices, and they are the ones that are choosing, in fact, to do this. It's not us that choose. We help build the capacity. Everyone in here that runs a relay helps build that capacity. They make that choice, and they're the ones that are behind filters. They're the ones that are behind censorship. And that context is very important to this work because the things that we're doing are, it, you know, it's not imperialism, what we're doing. What we're trying to create is an alternative, and they're the ones that choose to embrace it. I remember several years ago, I was being interviewed by a journalist who the first question they had was, so how are you doing against China? And I had to, to back up and say, no, 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 I'm writing software. There are people in China who are doing against China. You should ask them how they are doing. But it should not be up to me how China changes. We write tools to let people all around the world change the world in the way that they think their world needs to be changed. Okay, so our story starts in 2002 when we first did the release of Tor. Um, we wrote the design paper, published it in 2004. At that point, censorship wasn't even on the horizon. We were thinking of this as an anonymity tool. We need to be able to get lots of different users being using the same network at the same time. We hadn't thought at all about what happens when corporations or governments or other tools try to prevent people from reaching the anonymity system. So back in the early days of 2002, 2004, there really wasn't much, uh, nobody was thinking about censorship and governments trying to block these sorts of things. So the very first step was Thailand in April 2006. I got mail from some people in Thailand saying, uh, I live in a democratic country and they filter the internet and they just filter your website, this sucks. I'm going to sue, there's a constitution that says they're not supposed to do that. So they ended up doing it by DNS filtering. Um, only certain ISPs bought into this, so only some people who were in Thailand got censored. They ended up doing a redirection to a page that doesn't exist anymore. Um, the only certain ISPs bought into it reminds me of a bunch of other countries out there. Sweden, for example, there are certain ISPs who are thinking about buying into the censorship list. So that's a theme that we will see over and over. You, I, okay, so the next step 
Smart Filter and WebSense. So Smart Filter was the first corporation that started working on this censorship stuff. And in late 2006, so once upon a time, Tor spoke two protocols on the internet. We spoke TLS, SSL, to do the encryption side, and then we spoke HTTP to do the directory fetching, to learn what the other relays were. And that seemed like a good way of dividing things because you should use the appropriate protocol for the appropriate situation. But the problem was Smart Filter said, I'm going to learn how to block Tor just by looking for HTTP fetches for slash Tor slash. Anything that, any URL that people fetched that started with that, they would just cut. And not much of an arms race at that point. Uh, they basically blocked Tor if anybody was using Smart Filter to censor their, uh, their network. And pretty soon after that, WebSense decided that was a good thing to add, and then Cisco. And even today, there are a bunch of products out there that claim to censor Tor. And what they mean is they censor the Tor that we had deployed in 2006. They, do, they haven't updated it at all, but it works great on their marketing pitches to say, and also we censor Tor, even if it doesn't work. And of course, this is interesting because those versions of Tor, some of the older versions of Tor, in some cases are still in use. And so it, it, it creates a sort of false positive, false negative situation. Uh, however, there's a, a funny thing that happens, which is sometimes the filters get entirely replaced. And as a result, the old Tors and the new Tors actually both work again, even though they've replaced it with a brand new filter, which has happened in Iran and in some other places as well. And so this is, I think, quite a fascinating problem, which is that you can actually tell when censorship equipment has been switched out in a country. Right? When Iran pulled, essentially, the internet at a certain point, they put it in one gigabit at a time, because that was the capacity that the filters they had purchased, was, that was what they were able to filter in real time. And so you can actually see a stair step of their bandwidth ramping back up, because they were able to just plug in censorship devices at that rate, that line speed. And Iran is actually a pretty interesting case. I mean, everybody likes to beat up on Iran. Um, they're actually extremely interesting in the sense that they, I think, are the second largest group of Tor users at this point. Um, so recently, they blocked, I mean, not too recently, but a, a couple of years ago, they basically looked at all SSL, and they sort of treated it like a dial, where they said, OK, this is SSL, so we're going to turn down anything that's encrypted. They're not going to block it, but they're going to categorize, and then they're going to just discriminate against that traffic. And they, in fact, um, well, we, we were RFC compliant. We picked a particular prime for our Diffie-Hellman handshake, and that P was in an RFC. That, that P was filtered, so we, of course, had to change it so that we looked a little bit more like Apache and Firefox. And of course, when they filtered SSL, because the actual Onion router connections from the client to the routers look like SSL TLS, in this case, like a Firefox and an Apache, without knowing that they were doing it to Tor necessarily, they sort of got it for free. OK, so this, you, these are sort of the first success stories for Tor and censorship. Uh, here's a graph from summer 2009 when uh, a bunch of people in Iran were pretty upset that they'd elected somebody and that somebody uh, didn't end up in power. So we saw thousands of people every day using Tor to uh, get around the censorship of Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that. At the same time, I've got a graph of China up here where a little while after all the protests in Iran, China said, well, crap, I don't want to see that happening in our country. Let's do a show of force. We're going to block Google Search and Google Groups and Google News, and we're going to make sure that everybody knows that, that we're still in charge. So that was a start. Um, you want to take the Tunisia one? Sure. Um, Tunisia has been a particularly egregious censor in some senses. Um, we've actually recently been to Tunisia. Um, I, I try to make sure that I don't advocate the use of Tor in places I myself wouldn't be willing to use Tor. And some people that build circumvention and you know, so-called anonymity systems don't take that approach. And I think that's maybe not the most reasonable thing. We, we had a number of people in Tunisia that were willing to take the risk, were willing to go in and look at it, and had like a pretty serious analysis that showed that they would specially tailor censorship on a DSL line by DSL line basis. So it would be the case that you could only make outgoing TCP connections on port 80 and 443 and for DNS to certain DNS servers, as, as I understand it. And in some cases, if they thought you were a really high profile person that was worth targeting, you would only get port 80 
which is pretty, it's pretty incredible. And as a result, we, we realized that you could use a Tor bridge to connect to the Tor network, but you couldn't really bootstrap very easily if you wanted to connect directly, because none of the Tor directory authorities themselves were on port 80. And actually, it was in this room a number of years ago that um, I was asked to set up a Tor directory authority, ORAS, and um, it's on port 80. And it was specifically chosen to be port 80 for this type of filtering that was occurring. And we were lucky because it didn't appear that they were very good at filtering on port 80. So they sort of thought the port number was all you would need, and then that would be, that would be it. You wouldn't be able to do anything except HTTP on port 80. Well, it turns out that's not actually true, which was good, good for us. Those were the days back when people didn't do DPI. And it's important to note, we say smart filter here because it is smart filter. There's no mistake about this. This is an American corporation, which I think, who owns this after the chain of yeah, acquisitions? So, smart so we went to Tunisia in October, and we talked to the fellow who runs the Tunisian internet agency. And he said, yes, we did renew our smart filter license for another year. So it's great that he actually explicitly is willing to tell people that his government purchased censorship and surveillance software from a Western corporation, and they use it. And he brought up the phrase national sovereignty. Because he said, we don't censor anymore in our country, except for the governments and the military and the schools. But, but, but that's because they want it. And that was a kind of a weird conversation. And at that point, we started to realize, so you outsource your censorship and surveillance to some corporation, maybe in France, you won't tell us which one, and then they manage Smart Filter. So Smart Filter sold to Secure Computing a few years ago, and Secure Computing sold to McAfee a few years ago, and McAfee sold to Intel this year. So Intel operates the surveillance and censorship system for the Tunisian military, and they probably don't even know it. That's fucked up. Okay, so we move forward a little bit. Uh, those were the good days when people censored by port number or something like that. Uh, China is a little bit trickier. So in September of 2009, right before the 60th anniversary of some guy becoming in charge in China, they did a whole lot of blocking of lots of different circumvention tools. And they started out by blocking all of the public relays, all the, the public relays that were in the list. How many people here know about bridges? Let's see how much of a... Okay, I see some hands, but plenty of hands not. So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of how bridges work. Uh, so there, Tor has a big list of, of relays that is published for everybody. Uh, and there are actually two different pieces to Tor. There's the relaying component, which is given a set of relays, how do I build a path through them? How do I do the encryption? How do I do the congestion control? There's also, also the discovery component, which is how do I learn what relays there are? And the simple original design for Tor was a centralized directory system. There are eight directory authorities. Each of them produce a consensus list once every hour of here are all the relays that you can use. And it's critical for anonymity that every user has the same view of the network. So that's good. There's a big list. Everybody can get it. The problem is there's a big list and everybody can get it. And that means that bad guys are gonna pull down the list and be able to censor it also. So the fix for that is what we call bridge relays. The idea is we've got hundreds of thousands of users or other volunteers. Let's let them set up a Tor relay. And the only difference between bridges and public relays is the bridges are not in the big list. So we've changed the arms race from how do I give out 3,000 IP addresses to the good guys without the bad guys learning them, which is an impossible arms race, to how do I take these 500 or 1,000 or 20,000 bridge addresses and give them out one at a time to the people who need them, but not letting the bad guys learn all of them. So I did a talk a couple of years ago here in this room on the bridge design, and you can find it on the web. So if you need more bridge details, um, so how do you find a bridge? There are actually four ways that we distribute bridges right now. The first one is you go to https bridges.torproject.org, and it looks at where on the internet you're coming from and gives you a different answer. So that means everybody can get some answer, but if you want all the answers for that bridge strategy, you need to come from a lot of different places on the internet. 
So China broke that one in September 2009. They learned the public relays, and they also learned all the bridges that we were giving out through that strategy. So the second strategy is you send email from Gmail to bridges at torproject.org, and then we answer you a different answer depending on which Gmail account you have. And that means that everybody can make a few Gmail accounts, but hopefully the bad guys can't make thousands of Gmail accounts. And we leave it to Google to do some sort of rate limiting mechanism or CAPTCHAs or phone numbers or whatever they want to do these days to slow down account creation. And China broke number two in March 2010. So it took them a while. I'm not sure if they didn't think about it, if they did the first one and said, oh good, we've got all the bridges. Uh, that actually happens a lot with researchers where they sit down to decide uh, how safe our bridge distribution strategies are and they find all the bridges they can find and they say, aha, I have them all. And in fact, the goal is to separate the bridge list into different strategies. So even if you totally beat one of them, you haven't learned any of the other bridges. So China learned one of them in September 09. They learned another one in March 2010. Uh, the ones that still work are social network based. I know a nice guy in Shanghai and a nice guy in Beijing, and every day I send him an automated new list of bridges, which we haven't given out to anybody else, and he knows a lot of people and gives them out to people that he knows, and those work. The fourth approach is you can set up your own bridge. You don't have to tell us. We don't give it out. If you know somebody who needs a bridge, that works very well. So we've talked, for example, to a bunch of uh, human rights organizations in China who run their own bridges and then give them to people that they know need them. So there are four overall ways of blocking the Tor network. The first one is those eight centralized directory authorities, the ones that the Tor clients bootstrap from. They're hard-coded. The IP addresses are in the Tor source code. You block them, you're done. China did that. Nobody else has done that. That's kind of weird. The second one is you pull down the whole list, you block all of those, you pull down the list every hour so you get updates. Uh, China pulls down the list every so often, but not every hour, so there are certainly ways of sneaking by if you try hard enough. The third approach we're going to talk a lot more about today is DPI. You look at the Tor, you look at traffic flows on your network, and you say, I don't know what that address or port is, but boy, that protocol looks like SSL, but it's not. I know that it's Tor, and there are a lot of variations on that. And then the fourth one uh, that works better than we expected is you block our website. So back in the day, Thailand redirected DNS requests for torproject.org. Tor worked fine. The Tor protocol, the Tor network, everything was working fine. But if you can't get to our website, first of all, you give up. You figure, hey, this was nice, but it's gone. Uh, and second, how are you going to get the software? And there are a few answers, but the more they censor, the messier it gets. One interesting thing about number two up here is since we're in an arms race and we are trying to decide the pace of the arms race, there are some pretty funny things we could do if we decided to take the arms race in a different direction. So for example, if they have an automated program that downloads the consensus and pulls every single IP address and port number and then blocks it, <laughs> imagine for a minute in the consensus, and I'm not saying we should do this, but just imagine here for a moment, if they were to pull down that list and it included the IP address and port number of every website a Chinese person has to visit in order to get a visa, for example, their firewall would stop commerce in their country for a little while. So there can be some really hilarious unintended consequences with these surveillance and censorship systems. And that might happen accidentally in some cases if some of those people were to run Tor relays or bridges. So these attacks don't just hurt us. We are playing nice right now in some cases, and I think that that's important to note. We actually, we actually tried that particular attack that Jake was talking about, where we put in the IP address for Baidu, and they didn't block Baidu from inside China. So as far as I can tell, they actually have a whole heck of a lot of humans who go through every IP address and check it to figure out whether they should block it. So trying to attack them in a way that makes them spend more manpower uh, is not the way to attack China. Right. <laughs> this is a, an example of, I think, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, I posted online that I was looking for people to tell us 
whether or not the Tor Project website was blocked in their country. So in the upper left, the bomb site is not trusted, and the upper right, the, I don't know, coffee or lava lamp thing. Uh, that's the United Arab Emirates. Uh, in, the, in, the back, uh, in the background, we actually see uh, Kuwaiti. On the left, I think that that is also Kuwait. In the middle, that's the Sultanate of Amman, and on the right, I believe it's Saudi Arabia, so you'll notice they're blocked. This middle one is a form where you can fill it out, so I asked a friend in the Sultanate of Amman to just put my email address in there and to request that our website would be unblocked. A really interesting thing happened here, which is that they sent me an email, and I looked at the source of the email, and it's actually base64 encoded. And the reason it's base64 encoded is because they do deep packet inspection on the flows that are leaving their country. And so they encoded it in base64 so they could say, you have requested unblocking torproject.org. So base64 is basically what it takes to get past the Omani deep packet inspection. <laughs> So while, while China may have infinite manpower, some people have automated these systems. And another interesting point, which is worth making more for you than for us, is that those systems, uh, well, you should just uh, request that form. You'll notice that the mail systems they used to send it are send mail from 2003. This, um, this, uh, this is another set. Um, in the, I think in the bottom left, uh, and maybe that's Kuwait again. Uh, I think that's Kuwait. And the upper right is UAE. The bottom right, this is, I think, uh, kind of an amazing thing here. Um, they're trying to tell you, you know, that this, the site has been blocked. This is in Qatar. And they're trying to make it fun. <laughs> right? And if you feel this is an error, feel free to send them an email. They're trying to contextualize this in inherently fucked up thing that they're doing, which is restricting the right to read, to be clear and they're trying to make it fun. They're trying to make it like, oh, yeah, this is not a targeted sort of, you know, population control idea. This is uh, hilarious. Oops. <laughs> it's fascinating, though, because some places don't even do that. Right? They have a very different relationship where they're trying, you know, to do, do some kinds of mind control, essentially. And in this case, they at least are pretending, which is significantly different than some of these, maybe. Although the top two from the UAE sure are cute. Um, this is um, another view on the time that China, the very first time, the 60th anniversary of some dude getting into power in China. So this is a relay that I run in Amsterdam, and it on, basically it was one of the faster relays in the network for a time. And one day we went from approximately 10,000 users connecting from China on a daily basis, basically to zero. And that little bump in the graph is either an error, uh, like an error in our data set, or maybe it's when their censorship system wasn't quite working. It's important to realize the censorship systems in some places are very centralized in the same way that the ITU is centralized. You have a central telephone company, and they have central filtering, and that's sort of the edge of the country. And you think about it like a perimeter security system, so it doesn't work very well. And China has that, plus each ISP gets a phone call or an email saying, don't embarrass us you know, make sure you filter this stuff. And so in some cases, some ISPs have additional filtering or they are responsible for doing the filtering. And then there's also the edges. And so this might be a case where there was a, I think the term they use is harmonization. There was not harmonization between the filters in China. And then they sort of ironed that out. And this is what happened the same time. So just to show you that graph again, it used to be that users would download a new circumvention system, the whole binary, the entire shebang, whenever they got blocked. And I went to Hong Kong and a couple of other places, in Shenzhen and so into the mainland, and I talked with people and I said, hey, you don't actually have to download a copy of Tor. You can just plug in a bridge IP. And one of the people I talked with was an extremely well-known blogger. And he said, hey, Google and a bunch of places are about to get blocked. Install Tor today. If it stops working, use bridges. Here's how you use bridges. So they blocked Tor, and that's what happened. Right? I mean, to get kind of sentimental about it, this is sort of the triumph of the human spirit over censorship here. You got 10,000, and then you like peak. Like They realized that they were empowered to do something, and then they did it. Now, yeah. How do you know? Oh, that's a, OK. So, <laughs> Part of the way that we know is that we, we have developed a metric system at the Tor project that, in a privacy-preserving manner, does a, a pretty good approximation of the number of users that connect. So if you run a relay, you have a GYP database, someone connects, 
You look at their IP address, you do a lookup, and you put it into a bucket. And every 24 hours, you send just GeoIP data into the metric system, and it rounds up by about, it, it's a bucket of eight. So if there's only one Chinese user, there's an error margin there. But when you start to get into the tens of thousands of users, the eight, eight user bucket doesn't matter so much. So that's how we actually generate, if you go to metrics.torproject.org, we have graphs that show the number of directly connecting users and the number of users that use bridges. And the way we know where users connect from is by storing that in a privacy preserving manner. So no personally identifying information is ever sent anywhere except the, the name of the country. We don't do anything better than that. And of course, it's possible that a bridge or a relay can lie about that information. Um, that's definitely the case. The numbers I just showed you, this one is from my relay. I promised you I didn't lie. You can run your own relay, and you can find these numbers out for yourself, and you don't have to trust us at all. And the methodology for this metric system, uh, which is worked on by Carsten Losing, he, uh, he has published papers on how to do this. And we recommend for anybody that runs a privacy-preserving service, this is how you should do data on your users, right? There's no IP addresses of users to subpoena in our system. These are approximate numbers. And that's ex extremely important. People say you need to track people extremely in detail in order to know what's going on, and that's a lie. And when people tell you that, they're full of shit. And so you can do this in a smart way. So the other answer to follow up with that is the bridges are the first hop through the network. So they get to see the user, but they don't know what the user is doing because the user then builds more hops through the Tor network. So the goal here is the first hop, maybe they learn about the user, but they don't know what the user is doing. The last hop, they learn somebody went to Twitter, but they don't know who. So that means that this first hop can collect aggregate statistics, and as long as they don't publish anything that can harm users or reveal details about users, then it's useful for us to be able to learn which countries to focus on in a way that doesn't harm the users. So what Jake was talking about the good, was the good news, with some users disappear from the direct relays, and then lots of people use bridges. The problem here is once China blocked the second strategy of bridges, suddenly it was very hard to, in an automated way, if you don't know somebody, get to learn about another bridge. So there are two problems here. The first problem is we don't have good bridge distribution strategies. We don't have good ways to make sure that everybody who needs a bridge can get one, but the bad guys can't learn all of them. The second problem is we don't have enough bridge addresses. When I first started out this arms race with bridges, I, I was saying to myself, we need to get lots of bridges so the bad guys can't block all of them. That was actually the wrong statement to make. The correct statement should have been, we need the rate of change of our bridge addresses to exceed the rate of blocking that the adversary can sustain. It's not about get a large pool and then you're done. It's about continually churning through addresses in a way that's faster than the bad guys can keep up. So our problem right now is we have six or 700 bridge addresses, and they're basically static. There are hundreds of volunteers who have donated their DSL per line or something like that. So we'll talk a little bit uh, towards the end of the talk about strategies for switching from hundreds of static bridges to millions of dynamic bridges. But yeah, this is bad news for Tor in China right now. Uh, basically, China's kicking our ass at the arms race. And uh, we'll see some slides later on that show that it's even worse than this. Oh, great. I, I would say we, we might frame it sometimes as China is kicking our asses. But really, let's be honest here. What is happening is that China is oppressing their citizens and restricting their right to read. And their citizens have clearly got a desire here. And it's important to note that we have been here before. And since we're talking about timelines, I would like to go back to approximately 5th century BC, or whatever you want to call it. So this is important because it turns out that sometimes there's a relationship between real truth, like an objective thing, and how people of the day see that truth. So in this case, there was a guy who showed that the square root of 2 was a different class of numbers than the Pythagoreans appreciated, and they drowned him at sea, right? Well, it turns out that Iran is repeating this story. And the reason that they are doing that is because, as I said earlier, they took the parameter P from our Diffie-Hellman handshake, and they basically said, if we see a TCP flow that includes this, this number, we're going to kill the TCP connection. We are going to say that that is not all right. 
So I was joking with Roger, instead of irrational numbers, we've created liberation numbers. And these numbers are being drowned at sea by different governments and corporations all around the world. So there's actually a number right now. If you send that number after making an SSL connection in Iran, your connection gets killed. Which is also kind of funny if you think about what you could do with JavaScript and websites. But <laughs> ironically, they, they very clearly were targeting us. And if you, if you look at things like the DigiNotar debacle or other cases where some Iranians have really owned up a bunch of certificate authorities that kind of deserved it, they, they, they very clearly have people that are working on this. Ironically, SOX proxying, as we note here, it really wasn't. So sometimes when things aren't blocked, there's a reason for it. And that largely comes from the fact that censorship of services is, is an effect that happens as a result of other actions, which is to say that censorship is a second order effect of a surveillance state, right? Because they are watching, then they tamper. They tamper when watching is not enough. So using a straight SOX proxy is fine to let through in some cases because they believe that it doesn't harm things. It doesn't harm their surveillance program. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of leeway here. If you can camouflage your protocol to look like another protocol, then it's very difficult for the classification systems to decide that it's a protocol that needs to be blocked. And lucky for us, the DH parameter P is a server-side parameter, so we just had a patch out in just a few hours, and the relays upgraded, and the whole Tor network worked all over again. And that's what it looked like. Each of these red uh, dots here is a censorship event. And so they actually did these censorship events. You can see three here. You can see that they did them at particular times of the year that are actually, if we were to look at news stories, we would see that there's important political things happening here. So because we were able to get the patch out in a very quick amount of time, we were able to essentially help people who wanted to continue to use Tor, right? So I think the graph peaks at 12,000. So they went from making sure that zero of those 12,000 were able to securely communicate and then we got back up to 12,000. This is around the time, I mean, of course, this is not to take credit in any way for this happening. It's just to say that we're helping to create these alternative communications channels. And in this case, we see that they intentionally knew that something was sensitive. So they went to the trouble of working on blocking Tor. And then in this case, we were able to turn it around quickly enough that the demand was back during that particular time point, because it was sensitive. It was a time when people really thought about needing to be free from surveillance. Because this is a country where, when you log into your Gmail account, if they can do a man-in-the-middle attack on you, they will. And when they do the man-in-the-middle attack, they will take your email address, they will go to your house with the contents of your email, they will grab you, take you to the secret police office, and they will beat the shit out of you and torture you and potentially even murder you for the contents of your email. This is the same thing that's happening in Syria. So they really want to be able to spy on people, and then they prove to those people that they have this total view of your activity online. And Tor threatens that totalitarian control, and that is why they are attacking these things, because they are trying at the same time to attack their citizens specifically. And this gives their citizens something that gives them some of their agency and some of their autonomy, and it returns it. So when you run a Tor relay and you wish you could do something about this kind of stuff happening in the world, this is the kind of graph that should really inspire you to know that when you make a choice to do something like this, it actually does empower those people directly and immediately. And that keeps them safe. So one other point here. I have a friend uh, who's from Iran and does a bunch of trainings in Iran, and he tries to teach people about a lot of different circumvention tools. And a few years ago, he told me a story that I'm still trying to wrap my head around, which, so he, he said, I do trainings of lots of different tools. I've taught a lot of different people lots of different tools. Everybody that I've taught anything other than Tor to is now in jail. So now I only teach Tor which is a pretty scary statement because we're not perfect, the other ones are not as good, but holy crap, we've got a lot of work to do. So actually, if you write free software, could you raise your hand? Everybody here? It would be totally awesome if everybody that rose, if you're raising your hand right now, you should really consider coming and volunteering to work on tour because you'll make a huge difference in the world when you do that. I mean, no pressure or anything, but if you fuck it up, <laughs> you know? We need, we need good people to check our work. Yeah. <laughs>
So Egypt, e Egypt is a place that's very near and dear to my heart. I, I did some trainings in the Middle East. I even studied Arabic very, very badly. I'm, you know, non-existence. It's much worse than my German. Um, in 2009, and I went, I went to Egypt. I taught people about OTR. I taught people about how to use Jabber. I taught them about various different communication systems and how to use them safely. And at the time, I met some sensors, and they told me, oh, yeah, we use this Cisco gear. We do deep packet inspection on enemies of the state. And yeah, well, you know, I don't think too much about it, but obviously they're bad guys. So this is a pretty serious problem, but we, we tried our best to tell people in Egypt Look, surveillance is a big deal. You don't see it yet, but when you see it, it will be very bad because what someone can do is pretty serious. And so what happened in Egypt, of course, everyone knows, is that there was a revolution. And in fact, it's not that the revolution happened and it stopped on January 25th of this year. Rather, it is the case that the revolution is continuing nonstop, right? So this January 25th revolution is still going on right now to hear, uh, according to some of my friends that are in Cairo, covered with snipers. There are people that are being shot in the eyes. I mean, there's like a real serious thing going on in Egypt. And in the case of Mubarak pulling the plug on the internet, we saw that there was selective filtering. So for example, Twitter was filtered IP address by IP address. And so there was a case where a couple of the IP addresses were not filtered, and you could still sort of intermediate, and you, could, you could sort of reach some of them from some ISPs, and then sometimes you couldn't. But on Telecom Egypt data links, there were two IP addresses which were never filtered, but other ones on the same slash 24 that were. So you could prove without, without any question that they were filtering that right at the DSLAM for the DSL modem. And that's, that's a pretty interesting fact. And in fact, I went to Egypt um, after January 25th again, and I was on a panel with someone from Nokia, Vodafone, Telecom Egypt, the, uh, the head of the communications agency for Egypt, and um, I sat on this panel with them, which was a little bit awkward for them. And I said, you know, now that the dictatorship is gone, I have talked to many people in Egypt that wish to ensure that the Egyptian constitution is something that you respect. So will you agree to never censor the internet again? Will you agree to never send propaganda for whichever regime tries to pop up next? And Vodafone made the usual arguments about pornography and all the other nonsense things about terrorism. And they don't talk about, for example, how their spreading of propaganda is in fact propagating state-based terrorism against individuals that live in Egypt. They just sort of gloss over that. And that's something you can't just stand and listen to. So I, of course, said, well, I have evidence that shows that you actively engaged in censorship. And the telecom <laughs> Egypt executive said, that's not true, you're wrong. And I said, no, no, I have the data, and I'd be happy to provide it in a court of law. I mean, I'm not really a fan of law, but in your case, I'll make an exception. And, <laughs> you know, I'd be happy to provide it. And he said, I'm not saying you're lying. Uh, but okay. And he stopped arguing with me because he knew damn well that he had specifically and selectively targeted certain things for censorship and that they had collaborated with the regime. And there would be a time of reckoning. And when that time came, it would not be pretty for him. We got this on videotape, by the way, which is, which is pretty great. Um, but of course, unplugging the internet sort of changes everything. And as we can see here, there is a demand, and then there was a drop. And that's, I mean, that's pretty serious. They basically promise they won't do it again. However, and if you have a Vodafone SIM, you should consider contacting them about this. Vodafone said, we will do whatever the law says. Is, whatever is legal, they will do that. So what they basically said is, no matter what happens, we will do what we are told regardless of the consequences. It's not because we're afraid we'll be killed, it is because the, our corporate charter is perfectly aligned with the law. Right and wrong go with the law, hand in hand. And I confronted them repeatedly about this, and they continued to say that. That is not an acceptable standard of right and wrong, actually, and certainly not in a dictatorship where the rule of law is not controlled in any way through the consent of the people that are governed by this law. And it is really important to drive that home. These, these laws are bullshit, and we should disobey them, and these corporations should be punished by everybody for doing that. So that was January. You'll notice that these slides are showing up more and more closely together at this point. In March, uh, Libya, they didn't cut off the internet in the same way that Egypt did, but they might as well have. 
So there were a bunch of people who were starting to use it and then they, they throttled everything. They didn't unplug it in a way that everybody in Egypt freaked out about. They just basically turned down the bandwidth knob so there was nothing left. And there are a few people back using it. Part of the challenge with Libya is they don't really have an internet there to begin with. So you'll notice the numbers here are hundreds of people coming from the Libyan IP space. Another challenge is when you get a GeoIP database, it doesn't really care about Libya very much because the people who build GeoIP databases are building them to sell them to corporations who sell televisions online. And if the person is not going to buy a television from you, who cares what country he's from? So it's challenging from our perspective to figure out which country some of these users are coming from. Another issue here, I was talking to somebody from Libya who said, uh, the reason why you don't have most of us here is because we use sat phones that pop out as if we're from Italy. So hard to know how accurate the data is, but I think the general trend of lots of people deciding they, they need the internet, the internet getting throttled, and then slowly coming back exactly at the times of various political events is pretty interesting. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think that Syria is a particularly egregious example of a fascist state when it comes to the internet. And in fact, you can look at an internet connection in a country and you can sort of tell in general how free the country might be in terms of how people who govern the telecom infrastructure think that people should be and, and, and effectively what regular people are free to do online. And Syria is an example of a place that is so incredibly bad for so many reasons. Some of them are not public. I'm happy to make some of them public right now. One of them is that they actually record every single byte of traffic that goes in and out of the country, which sounds crazy until you remember that not a lot of people have internet access. And with deduplication, it is certainly the case that you can run a TCP dump on those links and record them, and it will not be a big deal. And I actually received some information from some people that built these systems through a Mixmaster relay. And I mean, I'd never received a serious email through an anonymous remailer before, which is pretty incredible. What they seriously do, though, is record everything. So just imagine everything you are doing is recorded, every phone call, every transaction, every email, all this stuff. One of the most critical components of a circumvention system, then, is forward secrecy. Does everybody understand forward secrecy? Raise your hand if you don't understand it. OK, good. Enough people don't. In Tor, when you connect to a Tor relay, you generate a session key that later, if you were to steal the Tor relay, if you were to take it offline, you were to break into it, it would not have that key anywhere anymore. There's a long-term identity key and a short-term session key that is generated. These are really, really important. That's a sort of oversimplification, but the point is each connection has forward secrecy. So when that connection is torn down, it's gone. That's a huge problem if you don't have forward secrecy in your protocol and they record everything. Because what it means is if you fucked up your protocol, and there are lots of people that have, and we'll talk about one of them in a second, if you do that and they're recording this, they can retroactively go back, find people, and kill them. And in Syria, at the Arab bloggers meeting in Tunisia, we met a person who told us that they had friends who were cut up into little pieces and mailed to their families in boxes. One guy who posted on Facebook about how he was sick of the revolution, not a pro-revolutionary statement, sick of the revolution and he didn't like the Assad government for the way they were handling it, and a death squad came to his house and killed him. They shot him to death. That's what happens when you're not using these circumvention systems. As they start to get more and more serious about counter-revolutionary things, they will relate technical attacks to the social realities of those countries and they will murder them. And that's a really serious problem. And I personally won't stand by and let that happen if I can help it. And so forward secrecy is a really important thing when you evaluate a protocol for use there. Another thing to consider is that America is actually, as usual, a big part of the problem. And so in this case, with Blue Coat, we know that Telecomics and a number of other people had access to some Blue Coat devices which should never have arrived in Syria, but they did. And we looked at the logs, and we can actually see a very high level view of what Blue Coat can see and, and to log. And the stuff that they're logging is enough to be able to say to someone, you posted this thing for sure. We're going to just use grep as our counter-revolutionary tool. That's a really serious problem. And in the case of Blue Coat, they could have done something about it. And they, they, really, they really didn't do something about it. In fact, they denied it for a very long time, which is, of course, nonsense. Because they know, and we know, and we showed proof of it. And a lot of people had access to those logs. And while I very much respect what Telecomics did, I think it's important to note that 
removing the logs and publishing them at the same time is a very dangerous thing to do, specifically because they anonymize the logs, supposedly, by removing the user's IP addresses from the logs and nothing else which is very unsafe. I mean, I think that that kind of hacktivism is pretty awesome in some regards, but in that case, the actual content Bluecoat recorded included buddy lists of people that were using just HTTP, right? So removing the IP address doesn't matter because their real name may have come across in that HTTP transaction, and it is logged in those log files. So very seriously, I have to consider instead, if you're gonna tamper with it, consider just changing the data to make it less incriminating, or maybe change it so all the IP addresses of all the users are only the Syrian government computers. There are lots of cool things you can do in that case, so just think, think it a couple steps out. And in the case of Bluecoat, they have a force magnification where they couldn't block Tor, and then they shipped an update, and all of a sudden, their DPI engine was able to tell that it was a Tor connection, no matter what port, no matter if it was a bridge or relay, and they were actually able to filter Tor. So we see this in those red points there. And so <clears throat> this is, I, I think, maybe an important point. I have a report that's coming out in the next, um, probably in the next couple months. I actually wanted to present it at the Congress, but some people have been making the very bad mistake of trying to gag me. And so I just have to update the report to include some information about that gag. So, um, <laughs> um, hey guys, if you're watching, yeah. Um, so UltraSurf is a system which the people that are involved in it, they mean the best. But in cryptography, well-meaning intentions actually don't really matter very much. What matters is whether or not you do it right. And if you find out you don't do it right, you fix it to do it right. Nobody's perfect. We don't expect anyone to be perfect. I certainly don't. I'm far from perfect. UltraSurf is an example of how instead of really designing for the real adversaries that exist, they sort of have no way to close the feedback loop. So to give you an idea about this, Tor is trying to look like SSL and TLS because that's basically the only protocol we can realistically try to look like and get away with it if we do a good job. And, and I'll show you, how do you check that? Well, here's an example. These are the blue coat logs that are UltraSurf. And we say worse and we say better for a reason, which is that neither is perfect. It would be so awesome if when blue coat looked at a Tor flow, they just they didn't see anything. That would be awesome. That's very hard to do. In this case, what we see is a couple of things. And so here's some O'Day for UltraSurf. Um, first of all, we see it is bootstrapping. So the bootstrapping process we talked about before, this slash GWT n colon u equals and this URL, that URL is in fact a CGI on a server. It's being fetched through Google. So Google gets a log of it. Bluecoat gets a log of it. And the data that's there, it's, it's actually encrypted with a static key that's encoded in their binary. And it tells you some bootstrapping information. So the thing is, you can visit that URL, or at least at the time that we pulled those logs, you could visit that, and you could, in fact, get the bootstrapping information out of it. I believe if you go to this, it pretends to be an RSS Atom feed, where the payload of the RSS Atom is a thing that says, begin PGP document, but it's not actually PGP which is another interesting thing there. So they actually send the string PGP, and it's not as strong as PGP. So they attract the attention, and then like assholes, they don't follow up. This is Tor. It just shows that there's a, a connection at all. It is the almost the absolute minimum thing you can hope for. And you can see the IP address of my Tor directory authority on the left, the, the thing that ends in 34, and you can see to the right another IP address, and actually in the very beginning of that, you can see you can actually see that this is not one of the Telecomics redacted log files. And talk about Iran. Okay, so moving forward a few more months. In September of this year, Iran filtered the Tor, filtered the Tor protocol again using DPI. So before they used DPI to look for SSL flows, and then they grepped for our Diffie-Hellman prime. At this point, they did DPI for SSL flows, and then they looked at our SSL certificate, and like good computer security people, we said, you're supposed to rotate keys every so often. So up until that point, Tor rotated its SSL short-term session key certificate every two hours, because you're supposed to keep changing it over time. The problem is, how many people out there right now run a website whose SSL certificate is within two hours of expiring? <laughs> Not many, it turns out. 
So if you combine we do DPI for SSL with we look at the certificate that you send and it's suspiciously close to expiry, then they killed it. So at that point, I mean, it's an easy fix. The fix is you can continue rotating your session, your session certificate, but you make it valid for a year, even though you keep rotating it every two hours. So it's not a perfect fix. I mean, the next thing they're going to do is they're going to say, why do you have an SSL certificate that was born within two hours of now? Because how many people have that? But they haven't blocked it. So the bigger picture here, there are 20 or 30 or 50 little tricks like this that you can use to distinguish the Tor protocol from an actual Firefox talking to Apache. And we have an internal list. We've got an idea of what they might do next. In this case, we had a list before, and one of them was they're going to look at the expiration time on our session certificates, and it looks a little bit weird. So when they blocked us this time, so in January they blocked us, and we took a few weeks. We were, were like, oh my gosh, they blocked us. Did they really block us? Let's get some people to do some tests. Okay, now we need to do DPI. Let's do SSL checks and so on. And we figured it out. This time we figured out what the problem was and put out a fix on the same day because we'd already done the work in January to figure out how to do that. So the, the, the big picture question here, do we fix all of these things preemptively because we know that there are ways that they might censor us? Or do we leave all the low-hanging fruit exactly where it is because the next time they choose to censor us, they'll do something we've already thought of? And there are a lot of conspiracy theory questions here. Part of what we need to learn is they're not trying as hard as they can to censor Tor. They could go out and buy Cisco and Blue Code and all these other things and pay thousands of engineers in Sunnyvale to figure out how to do it. They have a lot of different political motivations here. Their goal is to make a statement. Maybe there's a policy guy who calls up a technical guy and says, hey, can you censor Tor? And the technical guy thinks about some options and chooses this one. Uh, so there's a, we can learn a lot from the fact that Iran censored Tor once in January and once in September, and they haven't done anything else in between. So it's not huge multi-billion dollar government working night and day to do this. There's a lot more to it in terms of how the arms race is going. Now, one also really important point here is we are extremely clear about the fact that Tor is not a steganographic transport where if you use Tor, you are not ever going to be detected as using Tor. We don't make that claim because people who make that claim are full of shit. And it's important to know we say that very harshly because in the case of Ultrasurf, when we look at these things, they claim they are totally invisible and leave no trace, yet by design they use Google. <laughs> you cannot possibly consider having gained your users' informed consent when you lie to them. So we know these are unsolved problems. And we understand that these kinds of logs show up. And so while there are some distinguishers, one of the distinguishers is that you're using the internet at all. And it is very difficult to change this. And so we do not make the claim that no one knows that you're using the anonymity network. And it may be the case that someday in the future with systems like Telex, that it will be hard for someone to know you've ever connected to anything related to Tor. But it is super dangerous to make that claim, and we would prefer to be very conservative so that when people use the system, they know what we think they're getting honestly and truly. And that is absolutely the only way that we think that we'll be able to ethically do this kind of a thing. And so it's really important if you build or work on these systems to understand it is way better to over-deliver than to over-promise. Because when you make a mistake or when something goes wrong, real people's lives are really on, on the line. And we, we, don't, we don't want to mislead them. So here's the graph of people actually using Tor from Iran over the last year or so. You can see in January the little blip at the bottom. And that little dip towards the right, the red one, that is the 18-hour period in which they censored Tor after January. So, And another point here, uh, as of the past few months, Iran has just passed Germany as the number two country using Tor in the world, which is a pretty serious statement from a lot of people who are being seriously oppressed. And 
So going back to what Jake was talking about in terms of what we should promise, there are really two security properties that Tor provides in terms of anti-censorship, in terms of circumvention. Because we want to provide not only you get to the website, but we also want to provide you have some safety while you're doing it. So there are two components to what we mean by safety. And whenever you're looking at a circumvention tool, you should be evaluating each of these components in the context of that tool. The first one is, how diverse is the network out there? In the, in the case of the Tor network, we've got thousands of relays in a lot of different places, and the more relays we have and the more dispersed they are, the less chance there is for a given attacker to be in the right place to beat the anonymity and learn what the user is doing. So that was the old approach for Tor. The second approach that we've been trying to think a little bit more about in the research world is diversity of users. So if I give you a circumvention tool, and people can learn that you're using it, but they can't learn what you're doing with it, but the only people I give it to are high-profile Iranian dissidents, <clears throat> I've screwed up. I have killed them. We need a diverse set of users. We need a lot of people in Iran not being dissidents, but you filtered my web comics. I don't know why, but I'm going to use this tool to get around the censorship. We need a lot of people in America and Germany and lots of other places all blending together in order to provide plausible deniability or whatever we might want to call it. The corollary there is if there are 60,000 people in Iran right now using Tor, there's a lot of different types of people using Tor there. But if you're looking at Sudan, and there are, I don't know, 20 people using Tor in Sudan right now, we need more people there. We, meet, we need more diversity there in order to be able to make it safe. I think I should tell the FBI story now. OK. <laughs> you know, my lawyer's watching this video right now, I'm sure. Don't worry, not that FBI story. So. <laughs> no, 99% of the police make the rest of them look bad. So they're not all bad. <laughs> but, That joke never gets bad because it never stops being true. So it's, it's interesting because I was once at, a, at a, an internet meeting where they were talking about denial of service attacks and about anonymity and you know problems on the internet. And this FBI agent tells me, we don't ever use Tor. We have our own anonymity network. And by the way, criminals are so stupid, you'll never believe how stupid criminals are. And I said, well, that's really interesting. Maybe you only catch stupid criminals. And he said that he didn't quite understand what I meant. And I said, that, that makes sense. And so. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, let's consider your anonymity system here for a second. So you're saying you have an anonymity system that's only used by the FBI, and you only use it for investigation. So I send you a link, you click on the link, I watch where you clicked, what just happened? That's not an anonymity network, that's an FBI, police, surveillance, and investigation network. And his partner walks up and says, yeah, I use Tor all the time, this guy just doesn't get it. <laughs> Diversity of users is extremely important. And, and it's really important. There may be legitimate things that those guys are doing. They will actually have a different, they will have a selection bias, essentially, in what they see on the internet, because their anonymity system fails them. And they don't have a way to close their feedback loop because they're arrogant. And I would never want to be accused of arrogance. So I think it's important to note that using something with a diversity of users might help fix that problem. It might not fix the problem. But probably it fixes that problem, and they have no other answer to that. Yeah, so we see the same story again and again when we go talk to law enforcement and try to teach them about how the internet actually works. We were in Sweden a couple of months ago talking to the guy who was trying to push through the data retention law and another forensics guy who worked for the Swedish government. And the forensics guy waited until halfway through when the first guy was yelling at us and explaining that it's our fault the internet is messed up to say, oh yeah, I use Tor every day for my job. Does, and I use it at home too, shouldn't everybody? And the first guy was... <laughs> looking over saying, I thought you were on my side. I thought we were in this together. <laughs> so there have been a couple of other censorship things that we're, we haven't really looked into as much as we could. In October, we started to get reports that uh, Tor was not censored in Iran, but squeezed down, throttled. It wasn't working as quickly as it, it used to be. And we haven't figured out for sure. I think this one was a false alarm. But what would happen if one of the next steps they take in the arms race, they don't DPI and then find it in, and block it. They DPI it and then they put it in a different bandwidth bucket. So we don't get reports saying Tor doesn't work. And when we start doing our own tests, it works. The only difference is if you're doing SSL that looks like Tor, 
you get four kilobytes a second. If you're doing SSL that doesn't look like Tor, you get 20 kilobytes a second. That would be a much more subtle way of doing the attack in a way that makes it a lot harder for us to verify and change things around and figure out how to get around it. So I don't think Iran is doing that. China is doing something much more messy. And we were not expecting this step in the arms race for years. So in October, it started to be the case that you set up a bridge, nobody's ever used the bridge before, you tell somebody in China about it, their Tor client makes a connection to the bridge, between one and 10 minutes later, some other IP address in China makes its own connection to the bridge, does an SSL handshake, and starts talking the Tor protocol. So they are doing active follow-up probing of every SSL connection they see through China. That's a seriously huge next step in the arms race that we were hoping would not, not happen anytime soon. So we've got packet traces on this URL if you want to uh, start trying to investigate what's going on. I think they're running a quite old vulnerable version of Tor to do their own tracing. So... <laughs> And, and an interesting thing here is if you look at this bug, bug uh, 4185, you'll see the IP addresses of their probing systems. So this is actually a pretty fascinating thing for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that that's a lot like the FBI anonymity investigation network, isn't it? Well, it's good to know that the Chinese are tailing them. So it's, it's also the case that you can scan those IP addresses and look into them. I mean, they have an active probing system. It is not just for Tor, to be clear. They are doing these probes on different protocols. There was a Swedish guy who reported this was happening for SSH. So it is certainly the case that if you want to look into it, there is a way to trigger these, these probes, and then you have a client that is connecting to you. And of course, there is an IP address where they're connecting from, so maybe you have a server that's worth probing and scanning. We would love it if the CCC and the people attending the Congress this year would visit this bug report and would really put some time into helping us to understand this and to looking at these IP addresses and to triggering them and to help us because this is the future of many other countries when some American corporation decides to implement this and sell it to dictators. We need to really think hard about how to solve this, but we also need to understand the essence of the thing first. So we really need your help with this because there's a limited number of us and there are many, many more of you. And we will all be much better if we work together on this. Yep. So one other short thing that I'll, I'll, I'm going to skip a few slides towards the end in order to summarize this more quickly. Uh, there are fixes for this. Even when they're doing DPI for SSL and then they're connecting and they're talking the Tor protocol, the fix for this, Tor is developing what we call the modular transport system or pluggable transport system. And the idea is you can ship your Tor client with all sorts of little transports that you attach to it and then your bridge can say, I support the following ways of talking to me. And one of the first ones that we're working on is just another layer of encryption on top where the protocol is Alice sends some bytes, Bob sends some bytes, you XOR them, that's the session key. And the goal of that is there are no recognizable bytes in the protocol. So anybody who's doing DPI on content, it doesn't work anymore. They have to move to traffic timing and volume characteristics or something like that. So that's the way forward in the arms race in China if this is in fact what they're doing. We can't just try to look like SSL because then they're going to start talking to us and we're going to have to put passwords on our bridges. You're going to have to do the SSL handshake and secretly put in the password in order to prove that you really know about it. Uh, that way lies madness. We need to come up with better protocols that don't try to blend in with SSL but try to look like nothing at all. So here's an example of the Tor Project's website um, in Iran. You'll note that this is not our website. <laughs> And this is actually, I believe, the second most popular website in Iran. So if you wanted to help distribute, if you wanted to help distribute things, this like telecomics, uh, as you did in Syria, consider this. Um, this, this is uh, DNS poisoning for some ISPs. So you request uh, um, the IP address or the, the, you know, the, the, the name of a thing, you try to connect, you're either redirected by IP or you're redirected by DNS poisoning, and you get here instead of to the website you thought you were going to get to. And that's, that's kind of an interesting thing also because that means that building something for a censorship probe to detect that is pretty straightforward, right? There's like fixed strings on this, you can see that the server headers are different, it's very clearly not an SSL web page where you download Tor. But this makes a really interesting point, which is, that could easily be a Tor website mirror 
but with Trojan binaries. So it's extremely important to check signatures. And in places like Iran, maybe the way to get it is by sending, you know, get Tor at torproject.org via Gmail, where you have a, an SSL Gmail connection through a Chrome browser, which uses certificate pinning. So you know you're really talking to, to Google as much as anyone could be talking to Google. And you download Tor indirectly. And then you get bridges, and you add those bridges, and you don't connect directly at all. That would be a much better way to do it. Um, for example, lots of US government computers are filtered by blue coat, just like Syria. Turns out they have a lot of things in common. And <laughs> you know, killing people without trials, that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> it's important to really look at, at these kinds of things as what the next steps will be for many countries. And this is Iran as of just a couple days ago. So what we're up against is, I think, I'll, I'll take the first half. You take the second half. But. Basically, the really important thing to consider here is that it's not really countries, it's networks. And in some cases, some networks are weighted in a more heavy sense than others. So for example, in countries with centralized telecommunications facilities, such as Tunisia, they had someone blocking Skype and they don't know who it was. The Tunisian internet agency, the, the guy that runs it, he said to us, we have smart filter, it doesn't, it doesn't block Skype. But during the revolution, someone was blocking Skype. So the censorship agency themselves had to get the internet connection from the ITU body in that country. And someone in that telecommunications center had a different layer of censorship that no one knows about. They have never disclosed, for example, who the deep packet inspection vendor is. We actually have um, like a pretty good map of the Tunisian internet because they showed us their network operations center. And it's pretty fascinating, actually, to look at that and realize that there's this big black hole in their picture, which is their uplink in between the rest of the countries in the world and the Tunisian Internet Agency. It's their ITU body. And that ITU body has some pretty scary stuff in it. And that scary stuff can be bought from pretty much anywhere and installed. And it has a, a force amplification effect that's pretty serious. And so now, one engineer in Sunnyvale, California, like if you're blue coat, can make a really big difference where when you ship an update, you are actually materially harming quite a lot of people all around the world all at once. Right? And if you guys haven't read the book IBM and the Holocaust by Edwin Black, I really, you know, I think it's a really good thing to, to talk about. Even though machines themselves are neutral, you have to consider what it is that those machines are being used for and what it is that you are starting out to do in the beginning when you are building those machines. And while it might be the case that you think that it's OK to censor, for example, people in a corporation where you're certain it's your property and it's your internet, when that same equipment will end up in a dictatorship, maybe you should consider the relationship between the capitalist employment system and dictatorships in regard to control of information. And maybe it's ethical in one place, and it's certainly not ethical in another. And maybe it's actually not ethical in either place. But you have to consider that. Tunisia cannot afford to pay the R&D costs of a surveillance and censorship system for their entire country. They pay $5 million a year or something to smart filter just to get a license to do it. So the problem here is not Syria and Tunisia are funding the development of these things. The problem is that Boeing goes to Cisco and says, give us a tool to keep our employees from reading news at work. And at that point, Cisco says, give us millions of dollars and we'll help build one for you. And then once they've built it for Boeing, then they might as well sell it to Tunisia and Burma and anybody else who wants to buy it, because they've already got one. So part of the huge problem here is that Western corporations are funding the development of these censorship and surveillance tools, and then dictators get them for free. So how do we solve that problem? That's messy from a technical side, from a policy side. Part of what I was thinking about this before, so I was talking to Whit Diffie, the crypto guy, and he said, ah, the, this is easy. You build a list of all the companies that are willing to sell to bad governments, and you build a list of all the, uh, all the companies that are not willing to sell to bad governments, and then you publicize both lists, and then you let everybody decide to go to the second one. The problem is there are no companies on that second list. <laughs> there are no companies that are not happy to sell to any dictator around the world. So I'm not sure how to solve that problem, but we need some sort of answer. 
So I, I think, you know, I talked about this a bit in my recon 2011 talk, which there may be, there will be a video online of it at some point, and the slides are available. Um, but really what it comes down to is that corporations have the ability to affect change like even dictators cannot in their own country, right? So for example, if you are really good with BinNavi and BinDiff and IdaPro and, and all the rest of this reverse engineering software, which is like incredibly important at this point in time, getting the firmware images, mirroring them for these different companies, really understanding how their software works, finding out what bugs there are, that is great. For example, if there is a bug in a filter, such as in Iran, there was a bug where you could exploit the firmware where you would basically say G space E space T instead of a normal get request, and it would bypass the filter. Now, this doesn't really seem like it's very important, but what matters is that when that bug goes away, you know that they were patched, and now you know that there is collusion. Now you understand that the deep packet inspection machines are not like a car or like a Kalashnikov. What they are like is a guy with a Kalashnikov who hands it to the dictator, and then when it jams, he unjams it. And when he says, I need a bigger gun, he hands him a bigger gun. When he says, I need a gun that only tailors and only hits bad people, I say, well, what does a bad person look like? We'll design a rocket that specifically fits that. This is exactly what Deutsche Homag did. This is extremely important. What IBM did during the Second World War is identical to what these companies are doing now. And it's extremely important to look at that. So, so here's the question. If you could all go back in time right now and do something about that, would you? This is an honest question. No, no, not clapping, honestly. If you could go back in time, knowing what you know now, would you go back in time and would you set things straight with IBM's punch card systems? Yes, no? Okay, what if you didn't have to go back in time? You don't. These are the people doing it now. And they believe they're doing the right thing in some cases. So sometimes just talking to them will change it. But other times, reverse engineering, dropping bugs on them, monitoring what they're doing, monitoring the sales, just like we monitor arms trades, like Fefe said the other day, it's extremely important to consider these things like landmines. Surveillance systems should not exist. And we need to wipe them out. We have to get rid of them. And we have to do it by showing economically and from a human rights perspective that these things are not OK and we need to change them. So these are the companies. And there are more companies like them. And you can find them. And you should work on that if you have the time and if you have the inclination. You don't have to go back in time. We don't have to wait 50 years to fix these things. We can do it now. And that's what we're working on. So please come join us in that. So speaking of surveillance and censorship, part of the challenge that we had when we were in Tunisia and Egypt and other countries trying to teach people about these things, a lot of people say, yes, I need an anti-censorship system. I need something to get around the censorship. But they don't think if there is censorship, that means there is surveillance. If they are deciding which web page you get to see, that means they know every page you're going to. This is something that as technologists, of course, that makes sense. But for the actual users out there, the people who are risking their lives doing things on those networks, it, they've never thought about it that way. So part of our challenge in education is we need to get them to realize censorship, yes, you can see. If there's censorship, you know you want to do something about it. Surveillance, you can't see, and that's even worse. So we need to give them some ways of not being watched while they're doing something. We find a lot of people who say, well, yeah, I, I couldn't get to Facebook, so I used a circumvention tool. But then they unblocked Facebook, so I just went there directly. That's exactly what Syria wanted them to do when they unblocked Facebook. So part of our challenge is an education effort to teach them about how internet surveillance works. Okay, so I'm going to skip through some of the technical stuff because we're over time. Uh, I'll give you a brief taste of what's coming in future talks uh, so we don't have to talk about it as vaporware, but we'll actually be able to explain uh, what we did and how it went. So there are a couple of technical problems, research problems we're working on. One of them is how do we get a lot of different bridge addresses? I, we, right now we've got six or 700. What we want to do instead is get a bunch of corporations or individuals who have hundreds of extra IP addresses, leave them at the ISP that they're pointed at, but either give them a little box 
to tunnel them to us or ask them to put a line in their Cisco router that redirects them to us. And the goal there is to be able to hop around over millions of IP addresses and light up only the ones that we need when we need them. And that way we'll be able to churn a lot faster with the bridge addresses. It turns out there are millions of addresses out there that are not used right now. The end game is to go to places like, Cisco, uh, like Comcast and say, give us three or four out of every slash 24 you've got. Give us a couple of IP addresses that redirect to bridges and please change them around what they are from day to day. So that's the first research thing. Another one, how do we do traffic camouflaging better? How do we end up with traffic obfuscation techniques that, so the first step is the layer of encryption that I talked about before. That will win the DPI arms race for now because the only thing the DPI people will have is they will be able to say, that flow is HTTP, that flow is SSL, that flow is, gosh, I don't know. And all the DPI boxes have a little box to censor, gosh, I don't know, but that will drive up the false positives in a way that maybe they aren't comfortable with. So China, we've actually seen maybe this start to happen. China DPIs for SSL and does the active follow-up probing. In October, they were doing the active follow-up probing and censoring the bridge and then they stopped. Now they do the active follow-up probing, but they don't censor anything. Is that because they were recognizing too many things as Tor and censoring them, and somebody got upset that their website or some other protocol got censored? So part of the challenge here is to figure out what they are comfortable censoring, and that's a, that's a bad arms race long-term, because their goal is to go to large corporations like Huawei or Cisco or whoever and say, give us a better DPI box that can distinguish these things even better. And then the last piece, we need more bridge distribution strategies. We need better ways of making sure that the addresses that are up can go to the people who need them without letting the people who are trying to collect all of them and censor all of them learn about it. So we can do better by having a lot more addresses and having them change a lot more often. That means we can be much more aggressive with different strategies that we take. But we'll talk about that one in a future talk. So I think that, I think that it's extremely important, this is our second, slide, second to last slide. So I think it's important to understand there is a concept, it is called so-called lawful intercept. And I think that it is incredibly important to understand that we choose the world that we want to live in, especially in the so-called free world. Surveillance builds a totally different world. And one thing that we can consider is that we don't want to live in that world, and we can consider it before we live in that world. So when someone talks about lawful intercept or backdoors or delivering the plain text or administrative subpoenas or any of that stuff, what they are saying is they would like to expand the law enforcement capabilities, the so-called lawful intercept, and we must reject that. Like Evgeny talked about in his talk, talking about these surveillance systems, even though censorship is something we can identify with, we can rile against it, we must consider that surveillance, a total surveillance state on the internet is a very serious problem indeed, especially in places where the lawful intercept is put in by request of, say, the American government. When they make that request, Iran gets it for free. They would not be able to build it themselves. It also means that it's possible for other people to use those systems. For example, I believe it was the SNMP bug where you could specify only one byte was necessary for authentication. And I, I understand that that was actually possible to use against the lawful intercept SNMP interface for authentication. So it's like these systems are designed specifically to spy. So when they so, say so-called lawful intercept, you should read it as spy. And when they say, we need this to do our job, you need to see that they're saying, we want to expand the job we do. We want to make the Stasi look like they had nothing on humanity. Fuck that. Reject it. Reject it, absolutely and wholly. They don't need it. We live for almost the entire history of humanity without a total surveillance state. We don't need one now.
Thanks. 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 Let's, really let me are. tell you Thank something. You a lot. If, if anyone wants to go now, we're really over the time. If anyone would like to stay and ask questions, you have us for as long as you want us, as long as we're free to go at the end, officer. So <laughs> if anyone wants to go, now's the time. If you want to ask questions, there are some microphones. And I think that I, I probably have, the order guy question. wants to say something. Yes, so. exactly. Um, if you want to leave, you can leave now. I think we have time for four questions. One question, first question, is from the internet, and he's ready to ask that question. And then um, please line up at the microphone for further questions. Now the question from the internet. Uh, what about IPv6 issues in Tor? IPv6 in Tor. So we have IPv6 bridges working right now as alphas, thanks to the fellow sitting in the front here. So he would be happy to chat more with anybody who wants to learn about IPv6. One of the fun things about all of these censorship and surveillance devices, when Boeing goes to Cisco and says, give us a tool to censor our corporate network, Boeing doesn't use IPv6. So none of these tools that Cisco builds for Boeing do anything about IPv6. So if you're in China or Iran or lots of other countries right now and you can set up IV, IPv6, you are a winner. No censorship for you, but still surveillance. Okay, the microphone just, over there. Just want to thank the work you are doing to open our eyes, to try to bring us the conscience of how things are working or not working. I, I would like to ask if it's a chance to, uh, to, to share or to ask for a petition locally where the project is running um, at the laws that are not working, are not defending the free of speech of people. If it's possible to support a petition to ask for a law to protect the war and the free speech because if we fail as a system like the borders that separate the, the countries where people don't have the chance to speak free, let's try to make internet a tool that gives us the possibility to break borders and to have a voice together where we can find a space, a place to give to everybody that needs to raise the voice to find it. Well, thank you very much. The microphone over there. Um, so, uh, say I have an idea what you could do to, uh, uh, to improve the bridges. Why would I need to go to propose it? So you have an idea for what to do with bridges. Where do you go to propose it? Yeah. Tor has a proposals system, sort of like Python's proposals, where you write up what you think the problem is and how to solve it and what the security implications are. Uh, if you go to the Tor documentation page, you will find a pile of mailing lists and a pile of design documents, and there's plenty to read there. Sign up for the Tor dev mailing list and send your idea. OK, and last question from the internet up front here, the signal angel. How will the Tor arms race be affected by US senators? Investigations of Silk Road and the current SOPA tech attack on DNS. Will the US government stop being a Tor supporter? Hmm? I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> the question is, uh, will the US government stop being a Tor supporter? It's a, it, he asked whether or not, yeah, SOPA, is that what you said? SOPA, yes. SOPA. Yeah, he was asking whether or not the US government will, be, will stop becoming a supporter of the TOR project and specifically about SOPA. Those are oh, two separate questions. Okay. Yep. I, I'll answer the first part. OK. You answer the SOPA part. Great. OK, so the first part is that just like any place, corporation, country, and sometimes even people, the US government is not a monolith. So at least in my experience, we've got one group of assholes that detains me at the airport, 
and another group of assholes that would love to detain me everywhere I go, and then another group of people that actually really understand that anonymity is important and they should stop messing with me. And there are a lot of people that are good and believe that it makes sense for people to have the right to read and to do so without surveillance. SOPA is pretty scary, and Roger will talk about why, but it's important to just drive home the first part, which is it's not a monolith, so there are people that are both trying to help and trying to harm at the same time, and they're under the same flag, and we should not put those people together and say they're all bad because some of them don't have the foresight to realize that this is important. So SOPA is very dangerous for lots of different organizations in the U.S., but there are a lot of people who are I think a little bit overhyping the immediate problems that it will introduce for Tor. There are a lot of people saying SOPA will make Tor illegal. And as I understand it, what it will allow is the head of the Department of Justice can tell Tor to stop making Tor. Nobody else can tell Tor to do that. And if they do, then we know a whole lot of non of nonprofit pro bono lawyers who will help us crush the law. So what that means is Surely they will not be so foolish as to attempt to use their law on a tool like Tor that is useful for so many different things. I don't know if we will have to turn it into a legal fight. Hopefully we will destroy the law before it even happens. So thank you very much. The best of luck to you, to the Tor project, and thank you.